Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, good evening, welcome. And welcome to Conversations from the Field, Adapting to Extremes. And I want to um, welcome our audience that's here uh, joining us in person this evening, and also to you that are out watching us on live stream, or perhaps later at your convenience, wherever you may be. Welcome to this very important conversation. My name is Leslie Moulton Post, and I'm the President and CEO of Environmental Science Associates, ESA. And we are very pleased to be a sponsor um, of all of Sustainable Conservation's programs. I've been a, a personal donor for a good while, and I encourage you to think about that if you haven't. But as a firm, we also support their efforts to improve environmental stewardship in California. And I'll say that this topic couldn't be more timely and perhaps urgent. Um, ESA has a long history of working on river restoration and working to incorporate natural systems design into river restoration, river projects, and wetland projects. For example, work that we've been doing in Napa for many years, and I think um, all of us are aware of some of their flooding issues. It's interesting to me that in the last couple of years, in addition to working with the city and the county and the federal agencies, it's been the landowners that have come to us and said, we're facing persistent and increasingly frequent flooding events, and it is taking crops out of production and damaging our land, and we would like to develop a longer-term sustainable approach to this issue. Now, that is not necessarily at this moment climate change driven, but it will just be exacerbated by what is happening to our uh, climate and our systems through climate change. And I think it's quite remarkable that they contributed private land to the project to allow an expansion of the floodplain so that we could let nature do what sometimes it does best, which is handle variability. So again, I'm looking forward like you to hearing the panel bring us um, successes and efforts out of the field to really start adapting to extremes. And I want to introduce, with no further ado, Ashley Boren, who's Sustainable Conservation's Executive Director. You may know that they've been celebrating, as an organization, their 25th uh, year anniversary. And Ashley's been at the helm of Sustainable Conservation for 20 of those 25 years. And I think, really, it's been your vision and quite a lot of your energy, along with your team members, that have had such remarkable success working with multiple stakeholders to really advance environmental stewardship. And let me get the tagline right, because I think it's so important that what is good for California's environment is also good for California's economy, and that we can and we should do both. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, for those kind words and, for, uh, and to ESA for being such a great partner. Uh, and also for sponsoring this event. And I also want to thank Holland and Knight, who's also sponsoring tonight. There's a lot of co-hosts for the evening, so I want to make sure I thank you, Linda Rosenberg-Ash, Chris Bookbinder, Sally and Craig Falkenhagen, Charlene Harvey, Chip Koch, Steve McCormick, and Allison Harvey-Turner. Thanks for helping us uh, bring this event together. And then I want to thank everyone in the audience here at the Public Policy Institute of California and also all of those of, uh, that are on the live stream this evening uh, for joining us. So 2018 indeed marks Sustainable Conservation's 25th year of existence. Uh, for 25 years, we've been uniting diverse interests around common ground solutions to California's environmental challenges. Every day we bring together business, farmers, government representatives, scientists, and other nonprofits to steward the resources we all depend on in ways that make economic sense. We work on the ground and in Sacramento on, to implement solutions. Um, but for the past few years, we've also started uh, gathering a diverse group of in, uh, perspectives for conversations that we can have and share with um, you, our supporters and our friends. So this evening, we've assembled a great panel to talk about how California can adapt to the increasingly extreme weather cycles we are having in ways that protect California's wealth of natural resources, its people, and its economy. Um, we thought that the topic of adapting to extremes would be pr is pretty topical, uh, given the events of the past year. So we had Houston's severe flooding, uh, Puerto Rico's devastating hurricane, and then here in California, we've had five years of historic drought, followed last year by record snow and rain, 
and also record heat between April and September. And it, it was that heat was a significant factor in the then devastating fires we had in the North Bay and, and then also in Santa Barbara. So experts predict worse in coming decades. Droughts, heat waves, reduced snowpack, winter storms, and sea level rise are all expected to uh, intensify. How much will involve both natural weather patterns and the levels of greenhouse gas emissions in our atmosphere? So tonight, we're going to focus on adapting to extremes with water. And water is one of the primary ways that we are going to experience climate change. And water is obviously very essential to California. So we're very honored to have three of Sustainable Conservation's current uh, and future partners with us tonight. On the far end, we have Curtis Knight, the executive director of Caltrout, a nonprofit dedicated for nearly 50 years to ensuring resilient wild fish thrive in healthy waters in California. Dina Nolan is sitting next to him. She is the assistant general manager of the Madera Irrigation District. Um, the district encompasses 140,000 acres of farmland and the city of Madera in the San Joaquin Valley. And a fun fact I learned from Dina is that Madera is in the exact center of California. <laughs> and next to Dina is Tim Ramirez, um, a board member for the past six years of the Central Valley Flood Protection Board and also manager of San Francisco Public Utility Commission's Natural Resources and Land Management Division. So I'm going to spend about 40 minutes um, asking them a series of prepared questions and having a conversation with them. And then we'll open it up to the audience for your questions. So we're going to start off first with each of you speaking just briefly to the impact that the extreme weather of the last six years, the five-year drought and the um, in, you know, unprecedented rain and snowfall we got last year has had, what's the impact been on the environment and on your constituencies? And Curtis, I figure we'll start with you and what the impact's been on the, on the state's fish populations. Right, well, I would, uh, I would first say that uh, California is, is the, the water supply, the precipitation patterns, as we all know, has, is variable. It's becoming increasingly variable, but it's always been variable. And, and fish, likewise, have adapted to that variability. So they have that. They have that in them to be able to adapt to that. But when we um, increasingly constrain that freshwater habitat side, uh, we start to see declines, especially when these, we get these trends in variability that, that tend to go towards drought and dryness. So, so how are the fish doing right now? We did a report uh, last year that we released with UC Davis called the state of our salmonids. So we assess the status of all 32 different kinds of trout, steelhead, and salmon in the state. And, uh, the, and that included, really took into account the last several years of, of dry, the last five, six years of, of dry, dry weather. Um, and we found that 45% of those 32 within 50 years will be gone if current trends continue. So that was pretty startling to us, kind of a wake up call. And one of the most remarkable things, though, that gives us hope is that we still have 31 of these 32 here in California. Um, so so they, that just, they're scrappy, they're resilient, they're survivors, they've adapted to variability. We just need to give them a little chance. But the last several years of drought have been tough. And you can go to every region of California, whether it's the North Coast, where an exploding marijuana industry, especially over the last five, six years, comp compounded with a drought, has dried up streams for endangered coho salmon, steelhead, other anadromous fish. That's been rough. Uh, our state fish, the golden trout, the high Sierra, has had some streams dry up, populations decreased as, a, as due to the drought. Um, Southern California steelhead, we still have them, which is, should be surprising to everybody here. There are steel, southern steelhead that are trying to run up into the creeks of San Diego right now. So it's... <laughs> It's, it's resilient. They're resilient. And then Central Valley, of course, you know, in, in the news the last couple of years have been um, the impacts of winter run Chinook salmon, which lost their cold water pool during the drought out of, uh, out of Shasta Reservoir. So it's, uh, the drought has taken its toll. Um, Dina, how about for agriculture and the communities in the San Joaquin Valley? 
Yeah, so Madera Irrigation District is actually a very interesting district. We have not only irrigated ag, obviously, within our district, but we also have the city of Madera, um, and pretty much encompass about 90% of the city, so the entire population practically of Madera. And we also have rural residential ag with quite a few disadvantaged communities. So we have a lot to contend with, contend with when we don't have sufficient water supplies. It's not just the ag component, it's the rural residential and also the city of Madera. Um, in 2014 and 15, for the first time ever in the history of the CVP, the Central Valley Project, um, MID, along with the other front contractors, received a 0% received a allocation. When the CVP was first conceptualized, 100%... To say what the CVP oh, sorry, is. The Central Valley Project, which is the project that supplies water um, throughout a majority of the state where a lot of the reservoirs are connected. Um, Madera Irrigation District gets its water from Friant Dam, Millerton Lake, um, that actually has a relationship to the San Joaquin River. Um, and so when, when the CVP, when the Central Valley Project was first conceptualized for the state, 100% class one water supply is what we call it. That was gonna be an average year. Um, for the first time in history in 2014 and 15, we received a 0% supply. Um, us along with the other front contractors, which is from Chowchilla all the way down to Bakersfield. So essentially the majority of the San Joaquin Valley had 0% surface water supplies. Again, the first time in history. So we had to contend with that, um, not only from the perspective of our irrigated ag, but also from those who were losing their domestic home wells, um, those within the city of Madera who were encountering um, water quality and water quantity issues. So what the drought taught us was that, one, we really have to work together with our partnering agencies. So we had to work together with other irrigation districts to try to accumulate enough of a water supply for a run of what was available. But we also had to work quite a bit with the city and counties of Madera, which historically had not always occurred. Um, I will, will say that, you know, when people are put in tough times, they, they do tend to, to step up and um, personal nature does, does seem to prevail. So we had a lot of our irrigated ag partners actually pumping out and delivering water to the disadvantaged communities, to the rural residential areas and such, um, and something that historically had never been done before. Um, so that was nice to see. But in the wake of that, we also realized that going forward, our water supplies, what we had always assumed would be quote unquote secure water supplies, were no more. And we were really gonna have to change the way we operated as a district, which meant that in really wet years, we needed to capture every single drop of water that was available that we could. So when 2017 rolled around, that was a great opportunity. And thankfully, um, in that time frame for the past four or five years, um, we've actually been working with Sustainable Conservation and Earth Genome on implementing different types of programs, including on-farm recharge programs, and also in developing tools, including um, what we call the GRAT, the Groundwater Recharge Assessment Tool. Um, so that partnership actually really um, flourished, I would say, in 2017 when we did have the ability to start to utilize some of those tools that had been conceptualized for some period of time. Um, so again, what the, what the drought taught us and what 2017 has now taught us is that we need to completely change the way that we've historically operated um, and that we do need to capture, we do need to recharge, and we do need to be accountable for every drop of water that we have available to us. So, um, Tim, I, I, <laughs> um, instead of talking maybe about the impact of the drought, since you are on the board of the Flood Protection uh, Board, maybe you can talk about how did we fare uh, in the Central Valley last year with all the water we had? Sure. We, uh, we don't like droughts. Um, we prefer to have a little moderate flooding all the time. It reminds people why we have a flood control system. Um, <laughs> and we don't call it flood control anymore, right? It's flood management. Um, the board has a very long and from my perspective, a fascinating history in California. Um, it was long ago the Debris Commission. It was then the State Reclamation Board. And re very recently, it became the Central Valley Flood Protection Board. And for those folks that don't know, if you have driven through the Central Valley or you live in the Central Valley, Mount Shasta all the way down south through the San Joaquin Valley, past Fresno, all the way down to where Tulare Lake used to be, to the Kern River, to the King, to the Thule, all those drain in the Central Valley, and all that drains out through Carquinez Strait, and all of it drains out through the Golden Gate Bridge. So it's a gigantic system, and our responsibility on the board is to be the non-federal sponsor to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for all of the levees that protect all of the homes and farmland that are part of that system. So we don't operate any reservoirs, 
There are dams and reservoirs all over the place, state and federal dams, local irrigation district dams. Those came later. The flood system was built before all of those that we now have in place. So it's interesting to think about because people think, oh yeah, we have a flood, we're gonna build a dam, we're gonna make it better. There were no dams at the beginning. People built levees by sucking up the mud from the bottom of the river and piling it on top and then letting the water drain away and they called it a levee. That was the construction at the time. So um, last year we had a lot more snow and rain, which was really great. And it was really, uh, it happened in a way that the system was designed for, which is to say a little more traditional snowpack, not a lot of rain on the snowpack, and then generally the snow melts in the spring and it drains the system. So the Sacramento side of the system is totally different than the San Joaquin side. Sacramento side is built with bypasses, which are big floodplains that are very consciously carved out where people don't build homes, sometimes they farm, but it allow the, allows the rivers to overflow. And when the rivers get too full, the water flows into these bypasses and then reconnects further downstream. If you've been on Highway 80, gone to Sacramento in the winter, and you see this gigantic lake sometimes, that's the Yola Bypass. That's the bottom of the system, and it's one of the biggest bypasses. San Joaquin system doesn't have any of that, unfortunately. It was built for snow because it's a higher elevation. The Sierra Nevada in the southern range is higher. There's more snowpack, and it was really built to slowly melt off. So the rivers on the San Joaquin side, while they're gigantic when they flood, when the snow melts, they're very small. And it's a consequence the channels downstream are also very small. Um, and that was demonstrated in 97, um, more than it was last year, where we had a big rainfall event on a big snowpack. And then the whole system was overrun. We had flooding and levee breaks in, throughout the entire system. We didn't have that last year because it snowed when it was supposed to, it didn't get warm, it didn't rain on the snowpack, and everything sort of happened the way it was supposed to. We had problems, um, and part of the story, maybe I'll tell the longer version later, is that the state, as the non-federal sponsor, because of these events nationally that have happened, Katrina, Sandy, the federal government doesn't really want the liability anymore associated with having these gigantic responsibilities throughout the country to maintain these systems to protect communities. It's a huge financial liability. And the state is the partner because we've always relished that role as the backstop. And because of all these things that have happened nationally on the federal side, they've really ramped up the obligations of the non-federal sponsors in a way that honestly, people in California probably don't want to maintain the system. A lot of it has to do with the environment. Californians care a lot more about the environment. I shouldn't say it that way. California has a different environmental context than most other states. And as a consequence, we find ourselves often not personally, but institutionally not aligned with the Army Corps of Engineers. And so we have to make a choice. If we're not gonna meet their standards, they're not gonna be the backstop. And so after the, the moderate flooding last year, a bunch of repairs had to be made, but some of the levees that are no longer part of the program because the Corps decided they're not meeting their obligations, the state has to pay for that. That's millions of dollars that otherwise would have been paid for by the federal government. And so we got some federal money for parts of the system that are still in, but for parts of it that are out, the state had to go ahead and pony that up. And in a big flood, it's gonna cost California a lot more than it did last year. So um, given the impacts or the potential impacts, since it sounds like we actually did pretty well last year in terms of managing the floods, how do we best prepare to protect our fish populations, Curtis, for these inevitable droughts we know we're going to have and the, I think, future intense flooding events that we'll also have? Yeah, well, how do we prepare our fish populations for drought? Um, you know, I think one of the things that we've sort of taken away from them is, is uh, the diversity of habitats that they once thrived in. And think about that variability that we have in geography and precipitation patterns and all those sorts of things. And you can imagine then what the fish did to, to figure those places out. So if you think about fish populations doing well as a bunch of lights all throughout California, all those lights aren't going to be on every year, but some years over here they'd be doing good based on precipitation patterns, big flooding, dry, it's good in the south, it's, it's tougher in the north, vice versa. So those diversity of habitats, being able to get up into the high Sierra, um, being able to 
rear end floodplains in the Central Valley, a lot of that diversity of habitat is now gone and we have a simplified habitat. So a lot of what we try to do is to, to insert some of that diversity of life history characteristics and populations that we can get. It's about abundance to some degree, but it's really about the diversity of populations out there. And that really requires restoring a diversity of life uh, habitats that are out there. So dams, certainly blocking uh, vertical fish going, going vertical and getting up. 90% um, of the spawning habitat in the Central Valley is behind a dam if you're a steelhead or a salmon. So that's going to have an impact. So it shouldn't be surprising that a lot of those fish populations are compromised right out of the get-go. And then a lot of what we focused on lately is um, in addition to the vertical, we also need to think more and more about the horizontal. So Tim's levees uh, have a bit of an impact. Uh, if you think about the Central Valley, it used to be a big bathtub every spring. And think about all those fish running up into the upper Sacramento, the McLeod, the Feather, the Yuba, the American, the Tuolumne, the Merced, you go down, they would spawn up there and their young would trickle down into this big nutrient rich bathtub full of exactly the right water temperature, think February, March, that time period, April, they'd get fat and they'd slowly follow that draining water out the Golden Gate. And, and we have a much, uh, much different uh, setup now. So a lot of it is how do you find a way to insert some of that diversity in what are very much working lands. Dina, how about you? You touched on a little bit about the idea of storing, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about how Madera Irrigation District is thinking about preparing for, for future droughts. Yeah, so um, in the wake of the drought, along with, you know, dealing with a drought and the significant consequences of that, um, the state of California actually passed new legislation in 2014, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA. Um, and so SIGMA essentially is, what it's doing is it's forcing um, all of what they call basins throughout California, but particularly the Central Valley, to become what's called sustainable. Um, so there's a bunch of, there's like seven different criteria for sustainability um, that the state is, is having you address. Um, lucky for Madera, we only have to address six of them. So <laughs> de desalinization um, or, you know, saltwater intrusion is, is not an issue in our area at the moment. Um, but for the other six others, it's, it's essentially addressing, you know, the chronic decline of groundwater. Um, and, and, you know, Sigma, Sigma, Sigma was a long time coming probably um, and is much needed because not only is it um, going to help us address, address the groundwater decline, but it's going to help us prepare for the droughts in the future. Um, and it's going to help us figure out ways where, you know, we need to do more with less and we need to capitalize on the years when flooding, you know, is... Um, is a potential and so what we're doing within our district right now um, is we're looking at ways that we can either partner with landowners so we can recharge when water is available or we can actually identify parcels for dedicated basins and such so um, you know storage is very important and storage is important um, not only because you know it's something we need going forward but the other issue that's happening in Madera and particularly Western Madera County is subsidence um, and localized subsidence is a huge problem for infrastructure, particularly related to flooding. Um, in Western Madera County, there is the Chowchilla Bypass, which is a huge bypass facility um, for floodwaters. And in just a few short years, it has declined feet, like numbers of feet in certain areas, which um, it only exacerbates the flooding issue. Um, and the reason it's declined is because there has been so much groundwater extraction during the drought years. So everything goes hand in hand, right? The, the drought um, creates additional pumping, which creates subsidence. When th so then when there is water available, um, if you don't have upstream measures, you're gonna create flooding. You know, there's communities nearby, there's valuable farmland nearby. Um, and so all of these things, you know, are, are go hand in hand. And so we're just looking at ways, you know, to address them essentially as a whole. And, it, and we think there is potential. And Sigma is again requiring everybody to essentially do that. It's just in what time frame. So, um, Tim, in terms of uh, preparing for future flooding events, I have read a statistic that said, I believe it was, that the San Joaquin River could see flows increase by 85% in a high water year. 
how how do we prepare for that? Well, we better do something, right? <laughs> fix the bypass. Then. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. The San Joaquin, I think, from I'm, I'm a little biased. Most of my work professionally, despite where I've worked for the last 25 years, has been in the San Joaquin Valley, um, which has a, a large place in my heart. I don't know where that came from, um, but it's just a really great part of California. And um, it's precarious at the moment. And if we had another event like 97, we would have all of the same problems we did then. Nothing has changed from 21 years ago. Um, in some small ways, there was incre incremental progress that was made. Um, some of the farmers along the Tuolumne in particular and the San Joaquin, where there are not project levies, I wouldn't even call them levies. They're just, they were, there are farms that have bottom lands that are right next to the river, and then they have the next terrace up, which is a natural terrace, where they have um, orchards usually. But they farmed both. And after the 97 flood, they all got tired of farming the bottom. They're like, we don't want to do this anymore. It's too expensive. It's not worth it. It's too hard. We can't grow trees. It's too wet. And so the farm bill um, came through with a lot of really great emergency watershed protection funds and other programs they made available to private landowners which then partner, partnered with local resource conservation districts to acquire easements from um, those private landowners. So they're still privately held, but there's easements now to protect them. Um, and now they're being restored and they're part of the riparian corridor. Um, and there were probably a dozen projects like that. And there probably need to be, you know, 120 more. And we ran out of money. There was lots of interest. There was no money. Um, and it's a really great program because it really works and targets the folks that are on the ground. It's not, we're gonna come in and have a new group created with a new board and we're gonna have another part of the government and we're gonna manage this land. It's like, nope, we're gonna work with you. You're the landowner. You're gonna have your property up here. This is your property down here, but we have an easement and you're gonna manage that property in a different way. And it worked really great. So, you know, the we're not gonna build, I don't think, a lot more storage on the San Joaquin side. If we build any storage, it's gonna be to address multiple needs, not just flood control. We have lots of dams on the San Joaquin River. If we manage them differently, we'd have a lot less floods. But all those same reservoirs provide drinking water and agricultural water for communities downstream, and that's not gonna change. All of the rules that were set when those dams were built are all back in the 1970s. They're all old, they're outdated, they're not set in the current hydrology, which Ashley just cited. Um, and we know it doesn't work. So if we don't make more room downstream, um, then we're gonna have a lot of problems that we've had in the past. And if we made more room, we would address some of the fish needs and create more floodplains, and we'd have more recharge for people downstream as well. So it's one of those things that seems inherently obvious to be able to observe, but then to talk about it and make it happen at that scale is a lot more complicated. But you need the people, especially the irrigation districts in the valley, um, to be involved in a way that would be um, constructive and get behind it and help make it happen. Um, because I think the state has lots of needs, right? We live in California, it's a huge state. There's a lot of things that need to be done. And the Valley is um, a general funded effort from a flood protection standpoint and all Californians pay for it. And there's just a lot of other competing needs. And I think a lot of the direct benefit would come from people locally. And I think they're the ones who probably know best what needs to be done in some cases. And I think Madeira is a good example. So what you're describing there with those landowners was basically creating or giving the river more room and creating a, a floodplain. So um, I, let's just spend a moment on that because Curtis, I know floodplains are very beneficial for fish, so maybe you could explain why. And then afterwards, Dina, I think you probably think about floodplains in a very different way in the San Joaquin Valley, so we can talk a little bit about the differences there. Right, right. Um, you know, that whole idea that, that Tim's talking about of, of uh, you know, slow, slow it down, flood, slow it down, and spread it out, and that, that makes intuitive sense. And then you go to, well, let's just put this levee another mile over here and you run into the city of Sacramento, for example, or something like that. So it's, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not that easy, but there is ways to progress and, and get that lateral movement of our rivers that you, to get those multiple benefits, and I thought that was a great way of describing it. It's, we talk a lot about fish, water, and people, that you know, healthy fish 
abundant fish, you have healthy water, and that's better for California, it's better for our state. And this is a great example of that. If we can figure out a way to manage those, those flows to restore on, uh, groundwater recharge to help that subsidence issue, if we can spread it out instead of shooting it out into the ocean. If we can slow that water down onto floodplains so fish can rear there. Um, that's, that's the focus that we've been trying to experimentally do uh, with, with some rice fields, particularly in the bypasses. The Sutter Bypass and the Yolo Bypass, as, as was mentioned, um, still, still retain some of that floodplain magic um, that, during certain years, especially when they do flood. I think the Yolo Bypass spills, what, every five-ish years you get a good, four or five years you get a good healthy flood flow in there, and fish often will take advantage of that. And we think it's one of the reasons that in those wet years we see good returns of adult salmon four years later because they've taken advantage of that good habitat. So for us, some of the low-hanging fruit out there is to figure out how to manage these bypasses as sort of controlled floodplain rearing habitats every year. You know, you, you were talking about the ideal year that it spills uh, just moderately, and that is the ideal year. But we do have the opportunity to maybe manage these bypasses in a way that uh, mimics the slow march down of a of a floodplain rearing habitat for fish and that would that's that's hundreds of thousands of acres right there in those two areas so a lot of potential there and you combine that with um, some of the opportunity that exists in certain locations to we've been working with rice farmers again in particular because they tend to have some of that land right next to the river if we can find ways to bring fish into the, their rice fields for a couple months six weeks is all we need in February and March, right before they go to plant, and grow as our as our own Jacob Katz calls them floodplain fatties in there, and grow up for six weeks and then migrate back out. They're bigger and they're fatter than their scrawny little cousins who are stuck in a in a very different Sacramento River that's naked of food. It's quite a bit colder in the winter, and they and it's been scientifically well proven that the bigger you are hitting the ocean the much better chance you have returning as an adult. So that's, those are some of the things that we've been, we've been uh, playing around with in the floodplains. So, you know, Dean, I, th I think it's interesting to note that, so the Sacramento Valley, I think people know, is quite different than the San Joaquin Valley. I think I've heard that when you get the water into the Delta, 80% of it's coming from the Sacramento River and about 20% of it from the San Joaquin River. So it's a lot easier to do floodplains when you have a lot, when you have more water. And so, Dina, can you talk a little bit about the challenges of this concept of floodplains and, and kind of how landowners perceive it in the San Joaquin Valley? Yeah, and um, just so everybody's aware, I did work for the NRCS in a previous life. To say what the NRCS uh, is? The Natural Resources Conservation Service that, um, part of the USDA. And so we worked a lot with um, landowners on farm um, and in areas, especially along the central coast, where we did projects where we would um, essentially go in and on marginal farmland or different areas um, would, would establish conservation easements or floodplain easements and such for that very purpose. Um, so I'm very aware of, of the program and the benefits. Um, the challenges in the area, particularly in Madera where we are, is that um, you know everybody's pretty much fully developed out. Um, to the river, to the edge of the river. So, and it developed out in the sense of its permanent crops. So, you know, and, and it's very high value, high dollar land. So, um, you know, the land in our area right now for permanent crops is going 30 plus thousand dollars an acre. Um, that, that gives you some idea of the cost of establishing some of these programs. Um, that's on one, you know, uh, in one area of the river. The other area of the rivers, um, the Fresno River, for instance, that runs right through the middle of Madera, is fully developed out to urban. I mean, there's homes right there that about what would be, you know, the banks of the river. So establishing a floodplain in those areas, um, you know, at this point in time is probably not that economically feasible. Um, at some point in time, whether, you know, farmland has been taken out and it's now marginal farmland, or um, it's an incentive-based program, for those farmers, I, you know, that's something that, that I think that, you know, could gain some traction. But at this point in time, I mean, that's, that's the reality of um, at least where we're situated in Madera. There's other areas where they might have annual crops or, um, 
or rice farming or different, you know, different types of crops where those programs make more sense or at least are more, you know, are economically feasible. Um, but in our area, I think it would be very difficult to establish or, or gain any type of ground for floodplains um, in that sense. So a follow-up question to that, given this statistic that in a high year, because um, in most years it maybe doesn't have as much water as the Sacramento River, but in a high year, if the flows really do increase by 85%, are, are, are people aware of that, you know, potential occurrence, and how are they thinking about that? Yeah, um, I, I don't know if people are fully aware um, at this point in time. Certainly people who border the river um, and the river systems, you know, they realize, right, that they're more susceptible to that. Um, but as far as, you know, they haven't experienced any sort of real damage essentially since the 1997-98 um, floods. So memories, people's memories are short. Um, crops have changed. The, the use of land has changed and such. Um, obviously, our job's to help prevent that to the extent possible um, and to work with our, you know, the facilities and the infrastructure we have. We did a, you know, I think we did a fairly good job last year working with all of the different agencies. So there wasn't a lot of flood damage. Again, Mother Nature also assisted um, in that process for us. But again, that's why we're really trying to look at areas um, and people who do want to cooperate so that we can um, reach out to those people and those properties and such during these periods of time, you know, to prevent further damage, to prevent flooding downstream, um, and to provide benefits all around, whether it's, you know, recharging the groundwater aquifer um, or whatever, um, increasing habitat and such. So, um, so we're looking for those opportunities, but it's going to take some time to get these programs in place. So um, with... The severe drought we had and then the incredible rain and snowfall we had last year, there's been increased calls for more storage. You know, obviously what we need to do is capture all that water in the high years and store it so we have it for the dry years. And there's calls for both above ground storage and then below ground. So I wonder if you each, and maybe Tim will start with you, could just speak to what of which which projects that have been proposed do you support and which ones do you oppose and which ones are you maybe undecided about? <laughs> yeah, she asked Tim, just Tim, right? Not Tim Flood Board, not Tim San Francisco, just Tim. Um, I wear a couple different hats. So uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but in the grand scheme of things, from my perspective personally, um, if and when those things happen, I think we're going to get very little, if any, benefit for flood management. Um, I think it'll be driven by supply needs for people, um, whether it's drinking water or for agriculture. And, you know, the systems that we have now um, could be operated differently if we really wanted to improve flood management. And we've tried for 20 years to do that, and it's not happened. You know, every year uh, we talk about reoperation of the system to have these benefits, and it doesn't ever happen. In fact, the state, um, the reason the board was, re was recast as the Flood Protection Board uh, was the result, um, like many things, of uh, a change. There was a, a court case that the state lost about its liability. Um, the state had claimed it had passed the liability in the valley for levies to one of the local agencies, and the local agency says, no, we're the maintainer, but it's your responsibility. And in the end, the, the state lost at the state Supreme Court. And so after that, they said, well, we better have a plan. And so we should make sure this doesn't happen and we are on top of it. And so they recast the name of the board, its membership, its, um, to some extent, its authority, and also um, gave us this responsibility to every five years generate a new plan for the Central Valley to make sure that incrementally it gets better. And more storage and reoperation are always part of that plan. Last year, when it was raining and snowing, was our second time doing that. We updated our first plan. So we had a 2012 plan. In 17, we updated it. We thought it was great. I thought it was great that it was a wet year because people were going to pay attention to our, our plan. But every year we talk about doing things like this, and those things are not totally in our control. And so I don't think personally that storage is the most cost-effective way to do it or politically the most viable way to do it. I think the thing that would be the least expensive is to make more room downstream Although it's expensive in some places, we're not going to move the capital, right? We're not going to shift Sacramento and put it someplace else. Um, but that area is dealt with in different ways. There is still time in other places in the valley for that to happen. You know, I grew up in Southern California where people turned their backs on the rivers, and now they're trying to bring them back. It's really expensive now. 
You think it's crazy expensive in Madeira, 30,000 acres of land? Try the LA River, right? People are trying to bring that back now. And it's super expensive. And the Central Valley, especially the San Joaquin Valley, a lot of it has potential still for, it, for those, those things not to happen. Um, and I think it would be incrementally more cost effective and better for the environment if they were done rather than build new surface storage. Curtis, there's been calls to raise the height of Shasta Dam. There's also a very serious proposal on the table to build something called Sites Reservoir, which doesn't actually require a dam, but would take water off the Sacramento and store it off stream. How, what, is, what does Caltrout think about these proposals? Well, we, uh, uh, well, those two specifically, we've been pretty vocal, even as uh, early as last week as late as last week, on the Shasta Dam raise. And we've argued uh, for a long time that that doesn't make, uh, we don't think it makes water sense. Uh, we don't think the, the billion plus dollar cost is, is there, especially um, as, a, as there's a, a threat that that would be borne all by water, all by taxpayers and not by water users. That's always a constant argument with these things, who pays? Um, and then, and then for us too, there's some impact on the free flowing streams that go into the uh, the into Shasta Reservoir. So the Upper Sacramento and the McLeod, most specifically, which has state wild and scenic protection, and any raising of the reservoir would flood those uh, free flowing waters, inundate those waters, and that would be against state law. So. Um, Attorneys in the room might say, hey, well, federal law preempts state law, but we, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a legal argument to be had, and we don't want that precedent starting going the wrong way. And, and uh, the McLeod River in particular, with uh, its lower reaches already inundated by Chasta Reservoir, plus a McLeod Reservoir up higher that diverts 80% of its water into the Pitt River, I think you can easily say the McLeod's given enough on that end, and and we need to we need to draw the line there. So we're we're definitely uh, a a big opposed to that one, um, you know. And I think building new in river dams doesn't make any sense. There's not a lot of great sites for it. You're not going to get a lot of of of, of flood that 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 we don't see that happening. Um, something like sites, I think. You know, it's not something that we're we're publicly supportive as an organization, but it it there that's a, there's a discussion to be had there for sure about um, ways to optimize our our water storage, potentially flood control, but I think it's mainly a water storage type thing in a way that uh, uh, off channel. Uh, there's there's a way that that could um, there could be some there could be some benefits there if that's managed correctly. Um, and Dina, how do you all think about it? Store in, increased storage above and below. So I've already spoken quite a bit about you know groundwater storage in the form of recharge or you know um, whatever term you'd like to use for it. But essentially, you know, we are looking at that as a district, and we're looking particularly at that because it's our local projects, it's our local potential um, that the district can do fairly easily. Essentially, our low hanging fruit, and we do think there is. Um, real benefit in that. We have an aquifer that actually can recharge. Not all aquifers can. Um, and so we're going to, you know, attempt to utilize that. Um, the other component as far as surface, surface water goes, um, our board gave a very detailed resolution or passed a very detailed resolution um, a couple of years ago that essentially said, uh, we will support storage projects that benefit our district. So <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, um, we're not exactly um, sure. But essentially, you know, there's, there's lots of projects out there. There's lots of projects that have been discussed. Um, but we need to, you know, focus on what does that mean to Madera Irrigation District um, in this capacity. And so right now, uh, Temperance Flat is another storage project you guys, everybody might have heard of. Um, it's essentially just upstream of Friant Dam um, in, in the footprint of Millerton Lake. Um, we are a part of an organization called Friant Water Authority that represents uh, almost every district between Chowchilla and Bakersfield, um, and those are the Friant Division water contractors. So a group has been formed um, to essentially analyze what uh, Temperance Flat would mean to the Friant Division contractors, um, and we are part of that group. But at this point in time, our board has taken no action or stance on the project itself. So right now we're doing the research, we're doing our homework. Um, but again, the, the only resolution that's been passed to date is we're going to support storage that benefits MID. 
And then I think I'll, um, before opening it up to the audience for questions, we'll point out um, one thing that I think we all do know, which is that groundwater storage is just hands down more cost effective than above ground storage, probably for obvious reasons. You can imagine, you know, building a big reservoir or a dam. And the other uh, nice thing about groundwater storage is you can do it whenever you've got water. There, you don't need to go through any kind of environmental review or permitting process. So given the severity of the groundwater overdraft in some parts of the state, <laughs> well, the, the fact that you can do it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> The way every, you can every, do it quickly. Everything goes to environmental review. That's probably <laughs> true. But anyway, uh, you can do it quickly. You can do it very cost effectively. And, um, and you can start addressing the overdraft immediately. So it's one of the, the great benefits of groundwater uh, recharge and really taking advantage of our groundwater aquifers, which have three times the storage capacity of all of our reservoirs, above ground reservoirs combined. So there's a lot of uh, capacity and opportunity there. So I imagine there might be some questions in the audience, so we'd love to take them. We've got some, we're gonna take a couple of the microphones and we'll share up here. So if you've got a question, raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone and use the microphone because we want the um, live stream audience members to be able to hear you. For those of us that uh, are not involved on a day-to-day -day basis related to these very difficult issues, can you describe the politics as far as the funding of resources and how federal and state and county and cities work together and who is it that basically comes in and deals with decisions that are full of conflicts that have got to be resolved. Can we try? Sure. Um, it's a really good question um, and it's of course super complicated but um, I'll do my best to explain it as I understand it. Uh, for the flood control system in the Central Valley the beginnings really were all local. People created their own reclamation districts, they were called, they're still called reclamation districts. Um, and they were, uh, gave them the power to have a board that they were elected locally and then they assessed the district and they collected money to provide services. Some of them were flood management, some of them were water supply. Um, and there are a, there's a quilt of those in the Central Valley and to some extent, almost all of them have a role in maintaining part of the state and federal flood system. And they do that with local money. The state's job was sort of to knit the entire thing together and to make sure that everything worked the way it was supposed to as one system. And then the core, the federal government came and built part of that to make sure that it was able to be operated that way. And then the core said, we're done. You've got our federal money and now state, it's your job to operate and maintain it. And so the state does that, and some areas are state maintained, and it's the general fund's responsibility to take care of certain areas. If there's a local reclamation district, then it's their job to do that. Sometimes we work together. If there's a disagreement, it often ends up in front of the board. We're sort of the, the public forum in which all these things are able to be vetted, and it's transparent, and we're supposed to resolve differences if they exist of opinion about how to move forward. If we have to build something um, in the valley, it's the same setup as it was then, you know, 100 years ago. A project would be proposed, it would go to Congress, to US Congress for federal funding, and there's cost share relationships, non-federal funds, and the non-federal funds are split between the state and the local folks, depends on the kind of project. So everybody's paying a little bit, um, and a lot of it is driven still by the folks locally on the ground, um, but there's also money provided by the taxpayers of California and also the entire country. And let me, it is, I just wanted to point out, since you asked our favorite question, uh, we have this new plan and it's very expensive to implement. So we are going through this process now. It's one of our highest priorities as a board this year to talk about how we're going to fund all these things that need to be done to make sure the system can hand, handle all these new scenarios in the future that we're not ready for now. And we're talking about all those different scenarios, federal funding, state funding, and local funding to assess folks that provide, they get the benefits um, and also provide the services in a way that we think would be workable. And it's a super important thing for us because it turns out the state, besides being the overseer of the system, is a landowner. And we also have the power to assess as a board. And so we're trying to figure out, like somebody said earlier, who's going to pay for what so we can make sure that it's able to be done and then find a path forward. 
Um, Dina, you might want to also just add to that from the district's perspective and sort of some of the challenges that propositions that have been passed by the state create for you in assessing fees locally. Yes, um, when you asked the question, I was going to say all of the above is the answer <laughs> for city, state, federal. Um, so we are an irrigation district, which means we can assess property within our district. So we do have assessments, um, including assessments on land within the city of Madera. Um, those assessments were fixed um, with Prop 218 many, many years ago. Um, so despite inflation and, you know, the increased operations costs and such with time, um, those assessments are fixed, which means we have to use other methods to balance our budget because our costs have not gone, gone down whatsoever. Um, and as you can imagine, we have a lot of new projects um, on the books, including uh, managing a whole other agency called the Groundwater Sustainability Agency, which is an outcome of the Sigma legislation I discussed earlier. So that came with no, no funding associated with it. So, um, so we have a number, a number of, um, of different agencies that we're having to work within. Um, beyond that, we have to work with the federal government they actually are the con they hold the rights to our water and we contract with them. Um, we work with the state from the State Water Resource Control Board um, who kind of oversees the water rights and such. So we're working with with all different levels of agencies, um, but funding is exceptionally difficult uh, because of because of the limitations with Prop 218 and such. It's essentially a voter approved um, a voter approved process if we do want to do any sort of increases, which, you know, in the in the probably more so the near term are going to have to occur just because of the increased um, regulations and obligations of our agencies. Um, but going about doing that is a, is a, you know, sensitive and difficult process. And so, um, you know, we're, we're looking for ways, we're looking for additional funding. The state has come up with some um, proposition and grant monies to assist us initially um, in some of these processes, which is very helpful, um, but, it, but it's challenging. Arthur. I have a question. I'm a little, uh, oh, thank you. I'm a little um, confused about something, and I, I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe I'm getting a double message. So I just want to be sure. Uh, you're all talking about water storage. You're very articulate about it, all of you. Uh, but I'm, uh, Ashley mentioned before the cost effectiveness of, uh, of groundwater storage, uh, above all others. Uh, but I heard Tim say something, unless I misheard it, um, that you take a dim view of water storage, and you were talking about <coughs> runoff, letting it go to downstream or to the south or something. So I'm confused. Are you are you saying that about all water storage, or just particular kinds of water storage, or what? I think my response was to the question of the benefits of surface storage in a flood management context, and. From my perspective, I think if you're trying to improve, improve flood management and the ability of a river to take high water and to not create damage on its way downstream, I think you get more return on your investment if you make more space for the river rather than try to create storage upstream in a reservoir. And I think in a lot of ways, besides doing that in a cost-effective manner, um, one of the things that Curtis pointed out was um, the resiliency of the fish and also the diversity of their habitats. And part of why I love being on the flood board is we get to talk about flooding, which is sort of the heartbeat of those river systems and the physical processes that drive them. Sediment transport, high flows, fish coming upstream, fish going downstream. You know, we're supposed to make sure there's enough space for rivers to protect property, but we also want that space. We want high flows because of all the ecological benefits. So for me, it's really great because I think um, it provides a lot of different opportunities, not just managing floods to protect property, but it really makes a big difference. And we want that diversity of high flows in the system. If we captured all the water and none of it got downstream, we would lose all of those benefits. People worked really hard and they did a very good job about pushing water out as fast as they can when they're building flood systems, right? Build concrete channels, get the water out, get it away, shoot it downstream into the ocean, there it goes. And then people said, oh, wait a second, we're wasting all that water. It's being wasted to the sea. Let's not waste it. It's not being wasted. There's all these benefits that are provided. And if we took some of the water away, then we'd, we would lose some of those benefits. Stacy. 
So we live in a land of innovation and technology in San Francisco. I was just wondering if there's any sort of initiatives with private partnerships or foundations with the tech community or anyone kind of tackling this from the private sector. I know, Ashley, that's like the core of sustainable conservation. So that's question one. Question two is, is there any consumer impact on water use? I mean, my kids love to not flush the toilet during the drought, but does that actually have any sort of impact on sort of some of the, of the issues that you're dealing with? And is it just sort of the myth of, uh, you know, if you lose less, use less water, it would actually impact sort of the issues you're dealing with? So let's see, let's take those two. So right, the two innovation question, do any of you want to address that one? I'm going to try. I'm going to go first. I'll go first. Yeah. I'll put the plug for sustainable conservation and earth genome again. Um, yeah, I think that, I mean, there's definitely, um, with, uh, with the droughts and with the Sigma legislation and such, there has been um, kind of a new push in innovation, especially to irrigation districts and water districts, which historically, let's face it, haven't been on the forefront of technology, um, but are getting there. And so it's, um, it's a really interesting time. And I'm, again, I can't say enough good things about the partnership that we've developed and specifically developing a tool to assist not only our district, but you know, many, many other districts throughout the San Joaquin Valley and using technology and software and such to be able to do that. So um, there, there's that there's that area of technology. There's another area of technology coming out um, as far as metering wells, monitoring wells, um, you know, putting all of that on a platform for landowners and such. There's there's a lot of technology coming about related to um, related to water, water supplies, water conservation, groundwater management and such. Um, I mean, we're getting contacted constantly about, you know, new products and such. Um, but we're very picky in who, who we work with um, because we do want a very good partnership going forward. Um, so I will I will say that that is coming, um, maybe not as quickly as, you know, some people, particularly in the Bay Area and such, um, probably could have foreseen it happening, but it is coming and it is here, which is great. I'll just add to that because sustainable conservation gets calls all the time from technology companies that think they've got it, they've got the perfect tool and they got it figured out. But then when we talk to them and realize that they don't have any idea about how things work on the ground with farmers and agriculture, it's sort of this need to have Silicon Valley meet the San Joaquin Valley or the Central Valley. There needs to be a kind of a coming together. So um, I think there, but having said that, there's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of technological advancement that's going on. Um, let's see, the second question was whether having your kids not flush the toilet made any difference. <laughs> uh, who just wants? Should have a low-flow toilet first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's hard to measure, but I think there is a benefit, and I think you talked about that a little bit. Um, but it's it's a harder thing to quantify. But if you're not using the water, then the water stays where it is, and it might be in a reservoir, it might be in a stream, but it won't leave those areas until somebody needs it. It's a hard thing to wrap your head around and maybe to put a number on, um, but it is true that if you use less, then the water will stay where it currently resides. And I'll just play the Felicia Marcus, who's the chair of our state water board role here. And when the governor did do the mandatory conservation target and the fact that we, the population of California, almost hit that with, you know, not a lot of notice. And so not new technologies and things, we, that, made a, that made a big difference. So it, can't, it can be done. I really do think it makes a difference. Yeah, and without real enforcement, or, or it was a, it was a mm -hmm. suggestion. Um, but but and I think you can also look at LA and what's what's gone on there in the last 20 30 years remarkable how per capita use has continued to to go down the efficiencies have been great and that matters that matters a lot that that uh, it's a big metropolitan area that water use has overall really mm -hmm. gone in the right direction by the urban population I think I saw okay I just had a question for you Dina uh, obviously being in an area that's pretty in, has pretty intensive agriculture. Your Jing flood water recharge, that water is often contaminated with salts and nitrates and everything. And you have a lot of these smaller communities that can't pay for treatment of water. So in your recharge programs, are you building in groundwater remediation? Is something that you guys are doing to actually make that recharge water usable down the stream? Yeah, so actually in Madera, we're fairly lucky. We are, I mean, we're pretty much backed up right against the Sierras. Um, so we actually have very, very high quality um, surface water. 
And with that, we actually have fairly high quality groundwater also or historically have as you know as the groundwater tables dropped um, we are seeing some water quality issues but they're in fairly isolated areas uh, we have worked again I mentioned we have quite a few well actually almost the entire county of Madera is considered a disadvantaged community um, and so with that we've actually been working with quite a few organizations like self-help and such um, that that represent some of these disadvantaged communities um, in in our areas and so we are working on programs with them um, we don't have as many water quality issues as some of the the communities you hear about down in Tulare area and such um, but it is it's becoming more prominent and so we are addressing that and actually Sigma requires that also and I'll add to that one too because um Sustainable Conservation just finished a study with UC Davis and some others to look at what happens when you take fresh water from these Sierra streams, put it on agricultural land, and let it seep into the ground. Because there is nitrogen in those lands, and there's legacy nitrogen that has been there. And, and what the study shows is that for a period of time, you actually will flush, you'll push those nitrates down into the groundwater, and you actually will deteriorate the groundwater quality for a period of time. But then after that flush has happened, if you keep putting the fresh water on, you're going to start to improve the groundwater quality. And so it's a real opportunity for some of these areas that do have contaminated groundwater basins to actually bring them and make them much better quality over time. Let's see. Uh, Will. So this uh, relates to the question that you asked earlier. I'm wondering, um, we've talked about consumer behavior and flushing toilets, and to me there is an educational component in, in, that, uh, uh, in that orientation. So I'm wondering, Dina, and maybe the others, but particularly, do you have a relationship as a water district with the local school district? And do you have an avenue for mass education in your district? And I'm wondering if there, more broadly speaking, is a relationship with the public school system in general to educate people about the importance of water conservation. That's a fantastic question, and I, I promise I did not, um, did not uh, set him up for that. Um, yeah, actually, um, our board uh, um, is cons consists of five board members, um, and they, they have to reside in a division which includes the city of Madera. And they have been very um, supportive and encouraging of us to get out to community venues and particularly schools um, to do some education because we all know, you know, if, if the children learn it, they'll take it home, they'll discuss it with their parents and such. So um, for the past few years, we've actually been doing quite a few rounds with our local schools. Um, and I'm not wearing it right now, but we have a, we actually have a new logo. Um, and part of the logo process, part of us developing a new logo was actually going out um, and giving that presentation about Madera Irrigation District, why it's important to these, you know, these high school and these elementary students who are sitting in this room. Where does their water come from? Um, which a, MID is a huge part of, even if they live in the city of Madera. Um, and we actually had a logo design contest. Um, and so with that, we were actually able to develop a new logo because our lo logo was quite archaic that had like cotton on it and there was no cotton left <laughs> in Madera. Um, and so that was a fantastic outreach program because it gave us the opportunity to go out there and, and you know educate the students on our district and then ask them to design something that represented what we had discussed. Um, so that's one example. We've done um, contests as far as canal safety and such go, poster contests. Um, we just completed one of those. I just gave a presentation at a high school last week um, related to STEM, um, the science technology. Um, and such and so um, so yes so we are getting out there we are in the schools um, you know it, it's difficult we have a very large school district we have you know there's lots of students in our area but we're getting out there to the extent that we can um, we've also partnered with a lot of the other agencies to do public outreach uh, we have a constant contact page we have a Facebook page you guys can go on there and like us on Facebook and subscribe to our constant contact um, and then we, we try to do a lot of press releases so that the news and the media will actually pick those things up. So um, we've definitely become more prominent um, in relation to media and within the schools within the past few years, which has been great. Lastly, I know you've been trying to, and then you. Thank you. I wanted to ask a question about the reoperation of surface reservoirs. And, and, you know, obviously we're trying to combat a history of thinking of things separately, surface water, groundwater, flood, water supply. So may, I, I imagine each of you could speak to this a little bit about what what is the biggest impediment to having 
not just the conversation, but the action around surface storage, reoperation, and integration with groundwater, and integration with ecological process? Is it just fragmented institutions that have, you know, particular missions that, that haven't yet been integrated? Is it anxiety over water supply, and that is supreme, and nobody's going to let go of water to create space because they might not, they might need that water for drinking? I mean, yes. Uh huh. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, yeah. If it's behind a reservoir, behind a dam in a reservoir, um, you know, most of the reservoirs, um, all reservoirs have rule curves, they call them, right? Some of them are mandated by law as part of manuals to operate and maintain systems, federal and state systems. Um, any local reservoir probably also has a rule curve because it's the right thing to do. And generally, you have to carry lower storage in the winter so you've got room to absorb rainstorms and then in the spring snow melt without having your dam over top. Um, and people get very nervous about letting the reservoir go below that line because if it doesn't rain again or it doesn't snow anymore, then that water could have gone someplace and provided a benefit to somebody in that district. And it's a hard decision to make. Um, a lot of what we've been able to do in some places, especially in the Sierra, is make better use of more information that we get now about the snowpack. And so we know a lot more about how much water is coming in advance of it arriving and getting in the rivers. And so we know if we have space for it and we can manage flooding better. And so that's happened. And I think that's given people a little more confidence to follow those lines and to release water earlier because they know that whether it rains more or not, or snows later or not, they already have their storage. It's in the snowpack. It'll be there later. It's on its way down. And they can't keep what they have anyway. And so better to maintain space, which provides other benefits downstream. So I think better data does help. But in general, I think people wrestle with the multiple benefits that all the projects were built under, right? All of them, if you read the old you know, laws and regulations and project descriptions, flood control, water supply, recreation, fishery. All reservoirs in the state were built for all those purposes. But pragmatically, the people that operate them really care about one a lot more than the other three. And, uh, but I'm going to add on that one, just say it's a huge opportunity uh, to uh, reoperate the reservoirs. So you can think about if you let out the water in the fall so that it can more slowly be taken to be, actually be recharged into the groundwater, you actually aren't losing it, you're storing it. Uh, for future use. And I think that is just working with the Army Corps of Engineers and bringing them to be thinking that way of California's. California has the most volatile weather in the United States. I learned that interesting fact recently. Um, so we're not like the East Coast, right? We're different, and we're going to have to convince the federal government to change things. Just one thing on that. You, you cited also the fragmentation, right? You might, might be able to do that. You might know it's okay to be done, but somebody who manages the groundwater recharge base someplace else is not the same person who's running the reservoir, right? And so, and some places, maybe they have control over, you can't get the water from there to where it needs to go. There's not a physical connection yet. So there is room, I think, to tie these things together better. Um, and I think those things will probably happen, and my guess is they'll probably happen because of the groundwater legislation. Mm -hmm. Let's see, do we have any more? Okay, over there. Really quick question um, about multiple benefits and some of the ways, the new ways that you guys are kind of looking at, for example, levy setbacks, you know, that can benefit both flood control and fish or um, groundwater recharge, things like that. Or what are the, the, the key things that California is looking at right now for multiple benefits that will make everybody happy? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like that. The, 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 I like the use of the, the word multi-benefit, and it's a bit of a buzzword these days. And, um, you know, I think we've sort of laid out the case for the, multi, the multiple benefits that you get by, by letting the river spread out and slow down from a, from a fish and wildlife habitat perspective, uh, a, uh, uh, certainly a groundwater recharge perspective. But to tie it into this last question, too, also public safety. And... And, and possibly increases in water storage. That Shasta Reservoir example, um, you know, in 97, 98, that big flood that a lot of you remember that we keep talking about, it, Shasta Reservoir got really close to, to, to passing through water that was coming in 
was going out the other end, and that can't happen. Our system is not, uh, does not allow that. The levees will over the top, Sacramento will go underwater. So that was a close call, which, uh, which uh, has, has made sk folks managers skittish to, to operate that, the, re the level of that reservoir to keep it a little bit lower. Now, if we could um, expand that floodplain area down below there, you could get rid of that water quicker during flood periods and then better optimize the amount of storage you can get there. So just keep adding on the multiple benefits you can get with a revamped, um, a revamped floodplain. Uh, we, we see, we see a, a lot of opportunity there. Do you want to add to that? So from the Central Valley Board's perspective, the bottom of the system, the Leola Bypass, and then the area around Stockton are the areas we thought we needed to start first, sort of work from the bottom up, right? You can't make more capacity at the top of the system because the bottom won't take it. So you really need to make more room at the bottom. And then it begs the question, how much more room do you need, right? And the bypass is everybody's favorite place to work because it's already there. It's big. Um, it was designed very well. Uh, it's been operated very well. And as a consequence, everybody wants to do something in it, um, which makes it a very busy place. Um, we need a parallel on the San Joaquin side, something like that, I think. But, you know, if it's going to happen, then I think people locally are going to have to drive it and make it happen. That was the Napa story, right? People decided what they wanted locally, and then they drove everybody else and brought, brought them along, right? And I think the state can make it a priority and talk about the benefits it might provide, but it's a different project if the state comes in or somebody else comes in and says, here's what it's going to look like. It makes a big difference, I think, for the local communities to be a lot more involved. And I think that's really the magic of making things like that happen. And the folks at Napa, you know, really provided a great, great example of how it could be done. So let's do maybe one or two last questions. Richard, did, I, did you have a question? Or Chris, okay. Yeah, uh, this is a question for Curtis, but others may answer as well. Uh, I guess my question is, do our, the policies and approaches that we have in place now put us on a path to stabilizing or increasing the California fish population? Or do we may, need to make much more radical changes? And if so, can we do those in ways that have multiple benefits? Or do we have to do those in ways that have only benefits for the fish population? Yeah, that's a big, that's a big one. Um, yeah. Well, we talk a lot about, um, um, you know, a couple of things when we think about our, our amazing diversity of fish and how do we keep them around for future generations. And it, it's going to take multiple strategies. I mean, one thing we often say is that there's places in California that are still really wild and really cool. And we still have abundant wild fish there. Let's keep them that way because we've really seen that it's a lot harder to fix something than to just protect it. So, so there are places like the Smith River and the Eel River and the Klamath to a, to a large degree. There's improvements to be made in those rivers for sure, but in a, that's fish abundance. That's wild areas. Let's keep them that way. Um, so you need to throw that onto it. Um, you know, I think there's opportunities for increased investment too. And one thing we haven't talked a whole lot about tonight is, a, you know, our state is funny with these bonds. <laughs> And we do bonds different than a lot, a, at a bigger, bigger capacity than a lot of other states do, and a, and a lot of those lately have been focused on these water issues. So that type of, um, a type of increased investment too can be a really important aspect. And that type of investment is increasingly being steered toward. There's a lot in a bond that's coming up uh, in June. We're going to have an opportunity to vote on it, a park bond, water bond, that has a lot of money for. Uh, this multi-benefit type work in the Central Valley in particular. So we need to be realists too that, and from a fish perspective, we really believe that if we can um, pay a little more attention to what the fish need in these highly altered landscapes, they've proven that, hey, they're still around. They've proven that they could take advantage of that little bit of nudge. So when we think about a Central Valley water system that was designed with almost no regard for fish, and that they're still around, if we can make some infrastructure tweaks, we can go a long ways to try to insert some of these wild fish back into our working landscapes. We say that a lot. We need to, we need to figure out better ways to do that. And, the, and we think the fish could really respond to that thing. And I think the, the you know, working with, working to get fish 
into farmer's land to mimic lost floodplain rearing habitats is one example that, uh, that actually uh, was sort of paved, paved the way by what um, was done with waterfowl in the Central Valley. It's a huge success story. There's uh, a lot of waterfowl in the Central Valley right now um, compared to several decades ago. That's a big success story. We think we can do the same thing with Central Valley fish too. Shall we end on that positive note? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's thank our panelists, terrific panelists. So if you're interested in learning more about adapt, uh, adapting to climate change and extreme events, there is a, I recommend a podcast. It's a three-part series called California Adapts. It just came out uh, in the last week or so, and it's produced by America Adapts. But it was this three-part series was done uh, in partnership with UCLA Institute for the Environment. And it talks about all the things we have to adapt to. Droughts and floods, which we talked about tonight, but also fires, temperature rise, and sea level rise. So it's, it's a good series. Um, so I want to uh, thank all of you again for coming. We, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you for those of you on the live stream who joined us. I hope we've given you a window into some of the uh, challenges, the water challenges that California is facing in, uh, in the face of climate change and increasingly volatile weather. Uh, sustainable conservation is deepening its focus on water and will be um, uh, working with partners like these on many of the challenges that you talked about, that we talked about tonight in the coming years. Um, and so I want to tell you all of those here who are supporters of ours, how much we appreciate your support. Um, and hope you are inspired to continue to support. And for those of you who are not yet supporters, we hope you are inspired to become supporters tonight. Um, so I want to thank everyone again and our panelists again for being here tonight. And uh, I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.